Greetings and salutations, all you beautiful people, and welcome to another episode of Art of the Beholder, a show dedicated to all things eclectic in the world of art, where we do deep dives into deep cuts and help you understand why damn things matter. I'm your host, Nova Day, and today we're going to be talking about art in writing, film, and filmmaking by focusing on artist Charlie Kaufman. To hash it out, I am joined by one of our regulars, Mr. Philip Church of philipchurch.tech. Welcome, Philip. That's me. Thanks for having me. <laughs> um, how familiar were, were you with this guy before uh, we decided to do him? Not a ton. Uh, Ooh, he, was, he, was on, he was on the radar, and it wasn't until you pitched it that I dug in <laughs> and knowing how I felt about the works of his with which I was familiar. Yeah. I was like, yeah, let me like really just, just go down the rabbit hole and had, had a really interesting time doing so. Good. Yeah. So, um, I, uh, how deep did we go? All, all the movies basically. Oh yes. Okay. Yeah. That's going to be our focus for all, all you, uh, good boys and girls out there listening. That's going to be our focus. He's done, uh, doing our research for this episode. Of course, we learned that he, is very well rounded in the uh, the uh, literary and writing realms therein within this industry, but we're going to focus on the films, his uh, the bread and butter, the babies, uh, either the ones he just wrote and he actually worked with, you know, a collaborator, uh, and we'll talk about his frequent collaborators, and then obviously as he got his own uh, confidence, maybe if you will, uh, he started to direct a lot of his own pieces, and we're going to be talking about those as well. So overall, he is such an, an, an incredible force, such an incredible voice, because it is, my God, unique. His work often focuses on the strange, the, the thought-provoking, the philosophical, the eccentric, and sometimes esoteric, often pushing the boundaries of progressive idealisms or unconventional storytelling, and most importantly, almost always subverting your expectations. Now, before we can discuss, of course, we need a little background. Charles Stuart Kaufman was born in New York City, New York, on November 19th, 1958. He's often billed as a screenwriter, producer, director, and novelist. He's been nominated for four Academy Awards, twice for Best Original Screenplay, one for being John Malkovich, and the other one is for Eternal Sunshine of the Spotless Mind. And um, he was he actually won for Eternal Sunshine of, as those, he two, should. <laughs> of those two categories. He also has been nominated for Best Adapted Screenplay, for, of course, adaptation. Best animated feature for uh, Anomalisa. There we go. And he's won three BAFTA Film Awards, two for Best Original Screenplay, Best Adapted Screenplay. And uh, three of Kaufman's scripts appear in the Writers Guild of America's list of the 101 greatest movie screenplays ever written. So this guy is... Is it those... Is it those three award winners, by the way? I actually forgot to look that part up. I oh, I don't know off the top of my head, but I'm uh, assuming that Eternal Sunshine is at least is got to be in there. I feel like that's probably his apex, and we and we will get there and and in, in due time. And I due want time. it now. <laughs> but uh, you know, this uh, Philip this is a perfect example of a, another artist we like to highlight on our show here, right? Because I bet a lot of people know his work. Uh, it's, it's probably touched a lot of other artists in their lifetime, but they may have not known exactly who Charlie Kaufman is. So we're going to bring him to the spotlight today. But before we do of course we need a little word from our sponsor this episode is brought to you by the entropy sessions a tale of loss love and madness and our past present and future relationships with technology find it on amazon and as an audiobook through audible your support helps us continue our journey now back to the show so like i said in the intro we're going to be focusing on the bread and butter the uh what i call usually a writer or writer director or just directors babies so their main filmography pieces and we're going to start with being john malkovich 1999 being John Malkovich tells the story of Craig Schwartz, an unemployed puppeteer alongside his wife, Lottie, who finds work as a file clerk under Dr. Lester. Alongside his uh, colleagues, uh, he meets a character named Maxine. And there he learns of a mysterious portal that transports people into the mind of actor John Malkovich. It stars John Cusack, Cameron Diaz, Catherine Keener, Orson Bean, Mary Kay Place, and of course, John Malkovich. It was directed by by Spike Jones. So uh, this, I saw this as a kid. I saw it when it first came out. Yep. And I will never forget how, um, and I mean, I say this in a good way, how strange it was and how attracted 
I was to that strangeness. And um, let's we'll, we'll use a more historically um, positive uh, connotation for that word. Uh, surreal. It's very surreal because it's, this has never been done before, right? Yeah, I I like how he just came out swinging and by getting somebody <laughs> yes. like John Malkovich to be like, hey, I'm going to make a movie that's kind of about you, but like sort of a satire of you, but also not. You know, you're going to go crazy because the movie's about people can somehow get inside your head. Like, it's wild. It is just a wild premise. And it it's funny how I, I think of a very loose parallel between Charlie Kaufman now and... um. Wes Anderson. Well, and so and just just in the way that like this, like ever since their style kind of came out, yeah. they've been so fa- like you can just kind of tell one of their movies now. Like, it, oh, yeah. Signs. You're like, oh, yeah, that's a trademark of his. Like, they love that. Blah, blah, blah. Um, so it's really interesting having gone back through his films uh, to prepare for the show of how even this one, which I did also. Yeah, I saw that back in the day, too. Um I was not old enough to understand everything. I don't think. Oh God, no. Oh fuck, no, no. Oh yeah. What What I love is that he, um, you know, as much as especially how the industry has evolved over time. Now everything is taken over by fucking Marvel movies, and if it doesn't make a billion dollars, then they're not going to greenlight it. Well, back in the nineties, they would take chances on these guys, right? Yeah. And 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 this was um same with Spike Jones. This was his very first um feature and so what what a what a dream team of um charlie kaufman and spike jones um again if you don't know spike jones we should probably do a quick aside about him if you don't know spike jones you probably know his probably his last big feature which was her with joaquin phoenix almost probably most of the world saw that it was excellent film about uh what our future could hold but uh this was (laughs) <laughs> this was the opposite of that that spectrum is is looking into surreal works with actual act you know this is kind of the first time we saw that is real like real people real actors playing a fictional version of themselves it was meta before meta was meta yeah you know it was literally I, like over 20 years ago exactly you know i and this is ooh this is this is going to be part of the thesis he was always ahead of his time uh, when we get to eternal sunshine i cannot wait to talk about the tropes in that because it uh he started to touch on tropes before <laughs> it even became a fucking trope but of course before we do that we need to focus on mr being john malkovich and because yeah it um it it just played with like i said in in the in the thesis it played with unconventional um storytelling and then it would subvert expectations you didn't know what's great about his uh storytelling and his uh writing style is it's always very contained you know he always has like three or four main characters yep. and even though you think it's about you know some someone like craig and his lust for power essentially through this film to kind of take over john malkovich and be his puppet master we learn a lot about lottie and maxine and this is you know he's even touching on like transgender yeah issues. that really didn't like yeah that went right over my head as a kid even though it's openly stated like right. openly stated by Cameron Diaz's character Lottie in the movie. Um, but yeah, I mean, it, it's, it was, again, it was incredibly ahead of its time. Um, and I mean, there, it's interesting the things that stood out to me. Um, I remembered like some of the sort of like strange sexual themes of the whole, like Catherine Keener's character. Um, like, yeah, no, Cameron Diaz knowing, was inside John. Yeah, Malkovich, she is but he was seducing, the body. Or she yeah. was seducing John um, Maxine. As John Malkovich. Right. Yeah. And then even past that, <laughs> another thing was like, I was like, I feel like there's something that kind of was upsetting to me when I was a kid. It was when he like taped, it was when uh, John Cusack's Craig taped her, taped her up and like put her in the monkey cage basically, or the ape cage. Yeah. For it some was reason, that like threw me off. Yeah. It just, it's, it's, it's strange, it's, surreal. It's uh yeah plot points of how you know that that's another thing that i don't think he's afraid to do as a writer because sometimes it's a little nonsensical but since the whole piece is a little <laughs> surreal and yeah the premise right off the bat is nuts so you can yeah, do what yeah so he done. so yeah she gets saved by like her pet monkey right or something some shit like that like because of its childhood of trauma cage. of not being yeah. able to untie the the, the parents like the, the <gasps> oh. kidnapped oh my god yeah that because i remembered that once that came on screen i was like oh my god this is what that's from I 
I've thought about that. I was like, a chimp having like traumatic flashbacks. And yeah, and he always likes to. So, I mean, even with that and these unconventional character, um, usually occupations. Have you ever noticed that? Like he always yes. picks these very strange things that they do. And um, and I will say this as uh, in terms of analysis for for our discussion section. I always think these characters are Charlie. You know, Craig is Charlie. Joel is Charlie. Yeah. With the amount of neuroses throughout his uh, protagonists, you you definitely can tell that he is using this as some form of like catharsis, if you will, um, to work through something that all the tangential issues, of course, come up and he's not going to shy away from them. But yeah, at the heart of each matter is something that is relatively human and, and like how there's how there's very interesting it takes on just very blunt, like, you know, love affairs or just unrequited love and just stuff like that. Like, it's really interesting his take on so many of just the aspects of just the human condition, I guess. Absolutely. No, the human condition is, is I feel like a pillar of his uh, writing themes. Like he yeah. loves to touch on these things and identity, psychology. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's all like, of these human condition elements. Yeah, it's like he's found a way to use that surreality, surrealness. I don't know which of those words is, is correct. No, surreality, I like reality. it. Yeah. Yeah, um, use it. It's like he's found a way to use that to amplify just what the human condition can do to you. How, you know, like the brain will do all kinds of things to protect you or, you know, blind you to things. So, um, yeah, I mean, you might feel like you lost a bunch of time. You might feel like you're just skipping through time or like, you know, certain things aren't real or certain things are like a dream. Those are all very common, I feel like, sensations or experiences. And Lo and behold, like this guy just puts them into words and makes them go book, go up on screen with the help of other very talented people, actors, writer, directors, you know, all the crazy effects that have been used across his movies. It's it's in, it's incredible. Absolutely. And this is this also reminds me of this time looking back when I felt like there was so many like quote unquote pop A-list, you know, very blockbuster centered actors uh, or actresses uh, that wanted to say to the world, like, no, I'm a serious thespian. And Cameron Diaz is a perfect example of that, like, they made her really ugly and, you know, she's like, yeah. no, I'm not just the pretty blonde girl. I'm a fucking serious actress. And she is. She's, you know, she really killed it. And uh, the rest of the cast really killed it. Helped establish Catherine Keener's uh, career of, uh, as being a bitch. <laughs> She, she played Maxine, good. right? Oh, yeah. Heather Keener. She's, she's not only did she establish a relationship with Kyle. I, I but... thought she was, man, they made her really easy on the ice in this film. I was like, oh, she's, I was always been attracted to her, but I was, for, in this one, she was, there was a little touch of like, damn. Well, yeah, she is, she is the temptress for sure. You know, uh, that's the, I guess that's a lot of the point uh, is that she's a manipulator. So, yeah, I mean, she's got that going for her. And just, it's so funny how, like, you got to wonder, chicken or the egg kind of thing where it's like, does Catherine Keener get offered roles because she plays such a fantastic bitch or does she like, you know, like I feel like later in her career, she has such a sweetness to her. I feel like there's some, been she some can roles. Both. She can't. I'm not, you know, but I just feel like so many times, like it's like even in um, Get Out, for instance, how she plays like the yeah. evil mom character. And they're like, is I just feel like so many, she is too naturally good at being like actually sinister or twisted. She is such a good every character actress. actress. Yeah. yeah. And yeah. That she makes them all so realistic that uh, yeah, it's it's like crazy how she can be so real one second and she's just playing such a crazy character, but that you're like, oh, that's right. It's not actually Catherine Keener. She's she's in a, <laughs> she's just in a movie. And, um, and and same for John Malkovich killing it because he oh, had yeah. to play the so smart. many different Malkovich, versions Malkovich. of of himself being or as someone manipulating him as John Malkovich. Yeah, like it was just kind. Of, it's very it's very uh, yeah as you as you as you eloquently put it very metaphysical that if this could be a reality and then you know like when we actually when i was reading the um the plot synopsis to get ready for the show i mean it just goes off the rails with you know like um you know like dr we learned dr lester is um he's done this for like a long time of essentially finding the the key to immortality and yeah. he keeps going through these bodies and bodies and bodies. And Craig, we we learn that Craig Schwartz's character gets stuck in the 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 mind of um, the daughter, right, of of Lottie and Maxine. And um, so, what is it? You know what? I, I would love to hear. I'm going to be doing this a lot the show. It, what did this mean to you? You know, I know we already talked about obviously the themes that is the human condition. Um, but what what do you what was it trying to say? And in, in terms of in your eyes. 
what do you feel like it was trying to say? That's a great question, Novo. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think a lot of it uh, has to speak to just what... Like, we don't know who we are sometimes. You know, it's stuff yeah, like that to me. So, when, it goes you know, it's so many different layers and approaches of just identity in general of how... Like, who we are, are we sharp? Because it really is, you know, here, like, let me give you a little olive branch. Because I feel like, I think everyone goes through this phase in life, and it's very abstract to talk about because, you know, when we say this all the time, but we take it for granted. Oh, I'm just taking some time to get to know myself. You know, it's like, well, you're already yourself. Shouldn't you know who you are? And I feel like... Both are true because I felt I know I've gone through that where I'm like, oh, well, I'm just being me. You know, like you start to learn these parts of your personality that you 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 know, you were just born with. You can't quite always understand them or uh, hopefully to a lesser extent control them. Usually, hopefully you can't control them, but you start to understand who you are and and what you are, even though that, you know, on one side of the tracks, you're like, well, I I, I should be able to change these you know, bad habits or stuff I don't want to be. But then you have to sometimes have these serious talks with yourself of, oh, this is this is who I am. Like, I can't, you know, I, I was kind of born this way. So it, it is a very abstract thing to to see that dichotomy, I think. And that's that's kind of what I get out of these kind of stories. Yeah, and it, it, it also makes me think of that adage or whatever you'd call it, where let's say you've met a thousand people in your life. Well, that means there's a thousand different versions of you that exist in, in each of those people's head. Ooh. And that once again, like your identity, like a metaverse is still just in yeah, it's, one it's still universe. Just, yeah. It's still just you knowing well, yourself better than anybody. But at the same time, anybody who's ever met you and remembers you has whatever their version of you is in their head. And it might vary from who you are wildly to how, there's so many different things that you feel like can make who you are and how, of course, people change and people are different in each moment. Um, so yeah, just how identity in relation to one another goes. Well put. And uh, I think that allows us to move on to the next Very interesting film. transition script-wise, too. It's so These only came out two years apart, and it's wild. Yeah, 2001, we have Human Nature. It tells the story of a writer... You know, again, no no coincidence, a writer, so this is probably Charlie Kaufman again, um, with uh, hypertrichosis. If you don't know what hypertrichosis is, it's the abnormal amount of hair growth over the body. So this, they would often be in, you know, these quote unquote carnival freak shows as the monkey man or the gorilla man or something. It's just because their long hair grows out pretty much on every pore of their body. And so it tells the story of a writer with this condition and a, and a psychologist who finds a man acting like an ape in the woods. It stars Tim Robbins, Patricia Arquette, Rez, uh, Ifans, uh, Miranda Odo, Rosie Perez, and it was directed by, um, was is it Michelle Gondry? Yeah, Michelle. Yeah, Michelle Gondry. It was a less surreal to an extent in that there's no true reality bendingness, which is ironic given that Michelle Gondry was the director for this one uh, and things that are to come in this very podcast, as well as just Michelle Gondry's career. Yeah. Um, as well as just yeah, just the themes overall. Um, it, I just there were so many more metaphors and just metaphysical things in being John Malkovich. And this one was far more intended to a little more straightforward. It sounds more straightforward. Like. I feel yeah. like it wanted to be a little more of a comedy, like again, like a very <laughs> dark or like a sardonic. I feel like all of his comedy. movies always tinge. They always have like a hint of comedy, like or dark yeah. comedy to them. To all well, of them. I, I think that comedy is kind of unfortunate. Like unless you just really have a banger of a script, this is a small tangent. But I think comedy is one of those no, things please. that is actually like supplementary to everything else. Because if you think about. You know, if you're talking about like, oh, this movie was great, like Evil Dead or certain movies, it's like they're great because they can be scary as hell. And then you're laughing the next second and then you go back to shitting your pants uh, or like even even in, in a romance. It's like, oh, you can tell these two people love each other because of how they're, you know, like just the laughter that they enjoy. There's just something to comedy that it just pairs well with other things that, yeah, if if you it doesn't have to be a slapstick full of jokes all through and through to be to have comedic elements to it. And I think that is, yet again, yet another thing that just goes with the like the neuroses that Charlie Kaufman is, is like he's a, so aware of these things of that are his own that he writes into his characters that he can't help but make fun of them uh, as <laughs> yeah. well as just how ridiculous we are all as people <laughs> just just in general just just existing alone is is practically a joke and he just makes that all the more prevalent on the screen and so he takes this person who in this movie was basically like a Tarzan type person he was literally just and it thought he was an ape he lived out in the wild 
you know, civilize them. While at the same time, there's this other character who is human, but also looked kind of apish due to the hypertrichosis uh, and just them sort of like meeting in the middle and, and how, you know, Tim Robbins character plays in there as a, as like practically like the straight man, if you will, as that character is called of just being all too grounded. So this is another human condition though, kind yeah. of story of, of, of identity finding yourself even though, you know, they look the same, they're on completely different ends of the spectrum. Yeah, in, in a way, yeah. Again, it was, it was a, again, very, very hard left and not in any kind of bad way. But from what being John Malkovich was, it's very curious that these are two, which, you know, as you- There's you, a sophomore slump that a lot of people go through, musicians, true, uh, and uh, writers, filmmakers. A, as a writer too, you might know how people can sort of sit on an idea until it's the right time that your brain has that thing and then you develop it. So it might oh, have yeah. been- that being John Malkovich could be is the percolating one, for a long time. Yeah, being yeah. John Malkovich might have just been the one that he pitched and got a, re a really good studio deal with, and that Human Nature was like an old favorite of his that he wanted to try his hand. You know, who knows? Uh, I didn't look that far into it, but it, it was it was okay. I mean, it uh, you know, I don't think I'll need to feel the need to watch it again, or will strongly <laughs> suggest people check it out. But it was at least interesting to see again, knowing too that Michelle Gondry was behind it. Uh, if you're a fan of Patricia Arquette, like she may be naked. Oh yeah, through a lot I, of it. There's that. I love Patricia Arquette as she is. She, she has really evolved over the years. Yeah, remember shit like Stick intended. You know, um, you know where like she would play these kind of oddball yeah you know, roles, and now she's like in Severance and all the like. She's just like she's she's kind of gotten to this queen thespian status. And, uh, and and well deserved. I'm a big fan. One other small note: I feel like this might have also been riding the the wave of like Tarantinoing a movie in the way mm. it begins with the ending. I see. Okay. This one started that way, where uh, it's it's like the narrative is is basically being recounted to you, and so it begins technically towards the end, in that it kind of gives up what happens to the people, and so the movie is very much about the journey of what they are laying out of, like, well, this is how it started. But it's very much the like that the Risi Fan's character, um, because like another character is telling you the whole story, right? Yeah. It's like kind yeah. of told to you through another uh, vessel, you know? Yeah, and it's that not so much an omniscient. Character. There's, yeah, there is a narrator, and it's not just like an omniscient. It's an actual one of the people in the story, and uh, that leads us to 2002 adaptation. I'm very excited about this because this is probably one of my favorite works of his. Because Excellent if you guys movie. don't know. Uh, let me give you the little synopsis. It's very, very metaphysical because adaptation tells the story of Charlie Kaufman, the, the yeah. fictional version of himself. Uh, so uh, Charlie Kaufman writes about a fictitious version of himself named Charlie Kaufman uh, as he's trying to write a very important adaptation a piece, but he has writer's block and we get to see the story of what he goes through all of the struggle, the trials and tribulations, but with touches of surrealism. Again, we have the surrealism um, aspect that's, that's very much back. And that is with his twin brother, Donald Kaufman that doesn't exist in real life, but he gave him writing credits and everything. And this is like um, hearing the, the history of this. So, Guys, this one is amazing. Yeah. If you don't know what led him to write out of adaptation, he was literally doing this. He was trying to adapt a screenplay for Susan Orleans, the Orchid Thief. And he Which he is also literally a real had, book. Yeah. Like and it's and it's a real book, right? And he had writer's block and he was having such a hard time adapting this film because some 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 novels just do not translate well. You know, they're or they it's very hard uh or incredibly difficult to to translate translate it to a, a visual language some are written that way a very famous example is fucking uh, game of thrones uh, song of fire and ice or is it ice and fire <laughs> one of them it doesn't matter yeah song of ice and fire fire and ice so everybody knows that the television show game of thrones that was written because he was so burnt out with i think trying to pitch these as tv shows and fucking limited series and films and all this stuff for franchises franchises he's like well i'm just gonna create this epic fantasy and i'm gonna try to write it in a way that's almost impossible to adapt to screen of course they they pulled it off nicely for yeah. the, for all of them except the last fucking season but that's neither here nor there i digress but um Funny enough the last season was not an adaptation that's when they went off on their own that's true that's true they didn't have any source material it's interesting how adaptation in it's like not the actual movie, but just as the like a concept in an action continues to be a thing. And that, uh, as we'll mention in a little bit, but he uh, Charlie Kaufman wrote a book 
And mm -hmm. a lot of the thought behind his book was, I want to make a book that is literally impossible to adapt. And you know what? I didn't know that. I uh, let's we're getting a little over ahead of ourselves. Yeah, but just, that must be ant kind. Is that's yeah, ant kind, kind, right? Yeah. Okay. But so I, I know of it. I need to. Oh, I need to buy it. I know. I, I didn't have, have time to read yet. that. I was like, I could do the movies, but I can't read a whole book. Yeah, the, the book would take but eight to sixteen hours. I do hours wonder. Or with with the fact that like maybe he again like this was another one that he was sitting on that he knew would be a banger uh, it's just interesting that being john malkovich adaptation both metaphysical af both directed by spike jones and again like you've got michelle gondry who's who's worked with him on that second one human nature yeah um and where whereas G gondry goes on to be wildly more surreal than than spike jones does spike jones always is a way more grounded in reality if you ask me yes he does things like her which again is about a man literally falling in love with like a sentient AI, but still very much like a dude in a real world that is not, there's nothing that so It's not far-fetched these it's days too. It's just futuristic. It's crazy. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So um, it's interesting how these earlier ones that specifically with Charlie Kaufman are so surreal because yeah, it's like, yeah, adaptation is based on his experience and everything that he references even in the movie is literally part of like what you are watching is the entire journey of him struggling <laughs> to actually do it's it's so funny how it basically still is the it, the real life account but you can only get so far where you had to make an actual movie out of it well yeah there's still fictional elements a uh, uh, case like, in point of course, his no twin donald. brother yeah well, donald kaufman now these the kaufman brothers are played by our lord and savior both, nicholas, both cage. nicholas cage yes um and yeah i was talking you know i was talking to my wife and my friends about this lately for this show i mean on paper it is it is mind-boggling it is crazy to think that he decided to write his experience as this and literally put himself in the, the movie you know and um detail his the experience that he does and put it into a a, a film language to make into a feature like it's it's just so it's almost it's crazy to think is, that this got greenlit it's so metaphysical in that it literally is practically a documentary on what it can be like trying to adapt a books to the stream and that also he himself like didn't tell the the studio which i, forget, I think it was columbia pictures mm -hmm. um they asked him to do this and then they thought they were getting an actual adaptation of the orchid thief but what he turned in was adaptation because he had so much trouble turning <laughs> it into a hollywood blockbuster and in all the things that they talk about on the movie so like early on he's talking to um Oh, I've already forgotten the actress in my head, but the the like the movie Meryl Streep. No, no, no. Um, the movie exec. Um, I love the cat again. He's got, oh, he's got okay, great yeah. Casts, but um, so in this one, he's talking to the movie execs, and he's like, you know, I don't want it to be about like drugs and cars and shootouts and like blah 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 and like you know some stupid Deus Ex Machina, and how the those exact things come in through the fact that he has this person who comes in and is literally saying don't use a deus ex machina but the guy who tells him that is the movie's <laughs> deus ex machina <laughs> and that what the third act of the movie ends up being is car chases drugs sex like it's so it's so good you really just every this yeah really you is have to seminal. see it. this yeah. and and eternal sunshine are standout works if you do have to just narrow it down i would say go for both because one is far more dreamlike surreal and being john malkovich i will say that i will it's say excellent that the don't very get me first wrong one it is, is fantastic but so if, if if it's if you want to include three, then throw you know being John Malkovich in there. But I really think that a damn near everybody knows Eternal Sunshine because it was so groundbreaking and just made waves and won awards. Well, I feel like this one was groundbreaking just it was in terms the of of his unconventional uh, storytelling. Him because I I feel like I had never seen something like this too. Where especially when I learned the history, because I think anybody could see this and not even know that Charlie there was a real Charlie Kaufman. Oh, I had no writing idea. himself into the story, and they make an entire narrative around his experience trying to do this other real thing, which is because uh, like I can as an artist I can uh, pinpoint a handful of times where I feel like my mind opened in ways. I could I could have never seen coming or really can to this day truly comprehend how much it changed me. And the very the very the biggest one was reading 1984 and really uh, looking at the world so differently in terms of perspective, you know, like the two plus two can equal five kind of thing. And adaptation was the same way artistically. One other thing that I actually also want to touch on uh, with adaptation is um, 
how there's all these theories about how uh, Donald, which, who again is the, his non-existent identical twin brother, um, is literally a is, is supposedly in the movie like a figment of his imagination, who is the Hollywood sellout because as soon as Charlie turns to his brother Donald to really help him, um, Donald is the one who is all for all of the played out Hollywood tropes of just again like car chases, sex, and stuff, and that the movie ends. <laughs> Uh, how you maybe wouldn't expect of it kind of maybe being like slightly reeled back in, but it being on like Charlie's terms and that, you know, Donald dies. Um, and I, I remember trying to be like, well, so if I watch it again, how deep am I going to like pay attention to like, do other people talk to Donald? You know, just stuff <laughs> like that. So I, 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 I kind of forgot to keep that in mind. Uh, it wasn't until I was doing more of the reading up on it, but uh, I, I liked a lot of the things that people were sort of re uh, or I mean, discussing uh, and breaking things down. There's there's a lot of of clout uh, and chatter behind this movie, because, uh, again, it is it's, it's just all the layers are really rad. Like in like real people, like there's a real whoever LaRoche, there's a real Susan Orleans. Um, and, you know, that like Charlie Kaufman is again, like it's just it's it's so interesting how it's like a movie about a process, about a book, about a person. But all those people happen to be all in this edge. Yeah, it's it's great. It's it's it's, it's very yeah, hard it's, to sum up too much while still. Oh no! I I how great it is. I think to bring to 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 bring it home for just this section is it the effect is was you know I think it it rippled across the industry. I mean, to this day we see things like this. Like probably the most recent example I can think of is you know I grew up with uh, the Matrix trilogy yep. films and love those I, I think that's like the closest thing uh my generation has is to like a star wars you know growing up something yeah like that and uh they just recently did the matrix resurrections and there is so much metaphysical stuff in that where they talk about because they have a game version of the tr the original trilogy films uh in the fourth film and so there was there's so many there's so many things like that um that uh make it incredibly fun and metaphysical and kind of like poking fun at themselves and um, playing around with that kind of storytelling and narrative. Uh, before we move on, I, I forgot to mention the cast and, and, and director. So I want to do that real quick. Like I said, our Lord, it stars our Lord and savior, Nicholas Cage, um, Meryl, Meryl Streep and Chris Cooper. It was directed by Spike Jones. Uh, that brings us to 2002 again with confessions of a dangerous mind. Um, well, the reason they these come out back to back is they had you know he probably wrote them a long time ago and they got greenlit at a certain time and then they got two they got two different directors. Well, that this my, one my understanding was also that Confessions the book was written slash like the original story was not by yes. Carla but he he did the screenplay or the story exactly he did the adapted I think he he once had, again adapting that's like a it's literally an ongoing theme in his life. I love yeah. how he had to make a movie. He adapted about it, uh, it. the, uh, the novel, the novelization, or I think it was like, uh, it was one of those, like it tried to be autobiographical, but it turns into kind of, yeah, it was by the actual dude, Chuck Barris to my rec, to my recollection yeah. of looking through the research. But that of course he also went on to have to say like, Oh yeah, no, that's, it's not true. Cause the CIA was just like this nut job never worked. Let's, for uh, us. <laughs> <laughs> let's give the good people the synopsis. They're going to be like, what the fuck are they talking about? So the film Dude. tells the story. So this is confession of a dangerous mind 2002 the film tells the story of an american game show creator producer and host just like a phillips said chuck barris who claimed to have been an assassin for the cia in addition to his show business career it stars sam rockwell george clooney julia roberts drew barrymore and rutger howard it was directed by george clooney as well uh so yeah it's um like just, you know, you can hear me kind of smiling as I was reading the synopsis because it goes off the rails. Like, you know, he's like he's in the he's in the movie biz, but then he's also an assassin for the CIA. And so the story kind of details it has to be fictional. I, I couldn't see this being a real thing that Chuck Barris actually went through this experience and adventure as a as a double agent, as leaving the secret life, but also having this very public life uh so i i do think he kind of was making it up when i was doing my research for this but it what a fun story right this is a perfect kind of charlie kaufman story it just wasn't a just wasn't directed by the by the best choice yeah um 
Interestingly, I like George Clooney, but I, you know, yeah, his direction I, I'm is not, not the always... biggest. Yeah, I'm not. I, I've found out over time that I'm not a fan of his directing. And it is interesting, too, that, again, you know, Charlie Kaufman has always been like one to, you know, he gave Spike Jones like, OK, cool. That was his first one. To my knowledge, that was Michelle Gondry's first directing as well. So I appreciate oh, at least that that because there was also um, issues with it. Uh, at first, it was not meant to be uh, directed by uh Clooney I could have sworn it was going to be by somebody else and then uh something else just kind of like th things fell through and I guess because Clooney had wanted to play his hand at it he was mm -hmm. like oh yeah cool uh I'll do I'll it I'll give it a try because he's not <laughs> in it a ton direction is harder than people think yeah I'm know? sure it is but um yeah. apparently Clooney was also kind of um a big force in getting Sam Rockwell cast which I love because I've actually wound I up. I love Sam. I I love him. I've wound yeah. up really appreciating him over time. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it was Clooney's first directing, and I think that again, just with with the whole sort of based on a true story, but a true story about somebody who bullshitted. Um, I just al almost wonder too if once again adaptation is harder than it seems, and that because a studio wanted this made, and you know Charlie's not going to shy away from it, but Mr. Kaufman just like. He did the best that he could, and Clooney did the best that he could, and it just didn't wow me necessarily. I, I know a little bit of the history. So Charlie Kaufman is one of those writers that wants to be a part of the team from pre-production, production, all the way through until the movie is released, and George Clooney didn't want that because often in Hollywood, what happens is a writer will, will write a screenplay or an adaptation or whatever and then hand it over, and it's like, okay, it's in your hands now. You know, but and that I think that was where the conflict is. And I think it really comes out in the movie. Um, and George Clooney is just, you know, he's not as seasoned as, you know, other uh, directors. Yeah. Um, and um, and because so, yeah, he wasn't really involved. So like after Charlie Kaufman wrote the screenplay and, and handed it off to the producers and yeah, they, they greenlit it and they found the directors and yada, 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 how how all these machines work um he wanted to be involved and he just wasn't you know they just kind of was george george clooney was like i'm sorry i'm i got it from here kind of thing nothing personal and uh he just doesn't work that way then this is the exact same reason that's probably a good segue to uh, our next film eternal sunshine of the spotless mind which we'll probably just refer to as eternal sunshine or esad esam i like that one too uh 2004 this is the exact same reason why it was michelle condry again Yep. Because he likes he likes to be a part of the team. He helps because a lot of people what a lot of people don't know is there's rewrites. There's you know even though there's a, probably an original script out there or screenplay, the what you actually see in terms of the film is not exactly how that screenplay was designed um, in the beginning. Because once we have a team of artists coming together, or collaborators to make the piece, um, they can they can make things better. You know that's and yeah. I think that's what he wanted to do yeah so. to to break that down into two more digestible uh things is that a nobody no two no two brains are alike so nobody's going to see an artistic vision exactly how you do anyways so yeah. of course when you make a movie like this there's always going to be other minds and then also but just just bringing an idea to life both uh in the act of doing it as well as even just budgetarily so uh there's yeah there's so many things in it when you talk about a movie that is just so incredibly complex as far as the actual screen material uh i like that it happens so much in in like a, a sort of a real time ish um that it you know it's all technically happens kind of in like a night or so you know what i mean like since <laughs> since it's all flashbacks of of the main character's you know experience um that's it's kind of different in that john malkovich took place over years human nature took place over at least months uh, adaptation the same thing it took place over time Confessions of a Dangerous Mind it takes place over years. Let's, uh, let me give a quick synopsis. Yeah. Like that. So uh, Eternal Sunshine, um, Eternal Sunshine tells the story of Joel, who uses an, a, an alt medical company, that's what I'm calling it, to wipe his mind clean of his formal lover, Clementine. It stars Jim Carrey, Kate Winslet, Kirsten Dunst, Mark Ruffalo, Elijah Wood, and Tom Wilkinson. It was directed by, as already stated, Michelle Gondry again. Uh, so yeah, it um, to start a little bit of this conversation, I want to ask you a question. Uh, um, was he hooked up to the machine from the very beginning? I, I kind of know what you're getting at, and it's possible. I'm I'm still not sure where I stand on if the entire movie. Is, I say is a part hard yes. I I, I think that's the implication. Yes. I think that is strongly the implication, and I don't. The thing is that, that I most don't of have the movie good... he's just in that bed. Yeah, well, because and... 
because it's machine. also proven in the movie that it's not even the first time it's happened. Mm. So you, wait, you're saying that uh, they they've been together multiple times and they've wiped each other from their memories multiple times? That's my takeaway from it. Ooh, uh, I it didn't, is not I the first that time takeaway. that they've interesting. My yeah, my takeaway was actually that it's not even the first time they've found themselves drawn together because the whole thing about him not being able to explain why he wants to go jump on that random train, how that's just not like him. Um, and how even when somebody else says the things that he's said to her, like how Elijah Wood's character is literally like stealing his moves, thinking like, oh, this will just work, how it's all very contextual mm. and stuff. I never um, thought about me, it that just, way. It, it, I, I'm almost positive that after my first couple of watch throughs, that the implication is that he has done this the whole because there's memories he has about getting the process right. So how could he have memories of the whole process if he hasn't done this before and that he is just weirdly resistant to this mind wipe that his love is so intense that not only does it linger and that he revisits her interesting uh, but that like he even it. remembers the whole process i um i want to in my interpretation i want to believe that they that they you know they met on that beach from mutual friends at a party not on that you know when he was recounting the very very first scenes of them meeting on a train well that's, at, as far as their first meeting goes yes they actually met on a beach the first time yeah, like at their like a mutual friends party, right? Yeah, yeah. And and then they they fall in or they they start to date, they fall in love. Um the rest is history. And then, you know, this is very much a love and loss and then refound love story. Yeah. So of all the human conditions, this is clearly the biggest love story he's ever written. Yeah, while it's it's got its turmoils, this is the most like love story love story that he's written again there's like affairs and there's weird like manipulations and machinations of other like stuff but this one is just through and through like an actual like love is strong like love story type of type it keeps of thing. bringing them together yeah essentially. um and yeah. It, it, so again yet he while as i've said there there are things that i don't know how intentionally some of his themes are throughout his career and movies but um that this one still just smacks of Charlie Kaufman, but it also, again, is such a standout in that way. It's a standout, I think, again, because of uh, of Gondry's direction, too. Also and very how, true. And how much they experimented when they did the surrealism stuff, because a lot of it, I realized, I was shocked to, to when I rewatched it, I was shocked to see how many things were practical. Yeah. Like him, like, standing in front of that television, and then it had a, a little silhouette of his actual body, things like that. I mean, there was still the CG and that's when we get into some of the, you know, it kind of, what I love is that it, it was such a um, melting pot of a lot of, a lot of his best ideas from previous stuff. And so even though it had, yes, a human condition, condition elements that were focused on relationships and love and uh, those kind of worlds. I mean, he would still have, you know, just the traditional Kaufman, Kaufman-esque um, psychological elements, philosophical elements, definitely metaphysical. And then even like elements of a thriller, you know, like it was kind of like a thriller film for some moments of it. And then, and yeah, then horror. it's like, boy, yeah, it's, it's terrifying. Yeah. At moments, it just, oh yeah. All the, all the things that, uh, you know, love and, and, and a, a tumultuous relationship can do to you. Um, and especially when you're talking about experimenting with like your brain and stuff. Right. I mean, uh, it still is an interestingly like realist take on a very surrealist concept, which again, I just, I just love how he dives in, how like so many other people have at, like, it's almost like the because the viewers got pickier over time that it's yeah. like when you how like with Inception or even in like like you said earlier, like with Marvel movies, like people are almost picky to the point of being like, explain how they did it. It's like, no, damn it. There's just a thing. Exactly. Okay? The, the yes. whole thing is built on a premise. It's not real. That's yes. the point. Just go with it. You can wipe out memories of a person, you know, like just shut up and enjoy <laughs> the damn movie. But um, it is. I love the, the concept and how they just go with it. I feel like that is a um, a byproduct of a lot of internet cultures, kind of like redditors. You know, they eh. like they want to know, they want to dissect every tiny little thing, and then that created this this pendulum of people, this audience that has to have every detail about everything, and everything has to be explained. And that's the the beauty of, especially with fiction, and and specifically surrealism type of of fiction, is that you you don't you can suspend 
your belief, you know, suspend disbelief or whatever that's that the saying point, is. Right? You're already seeing a damn movie. It's not real. Right. It's not real. Like just, you know, like you don't need to know how this machine w- even works. You just know yeah, it's just the damn <laughs> that it does. It just fucking does its job. It just it just erases memories. Right. Um, um, one one thing that I definitely uh, just before we. Yeah. One more. On, one more touch. And then we got to move on. I'm looking. Um, at the I like that. This is when uh, he he that. Kaufman first worked with, uh, I believe it's pronounced John Bryan or Brian, but um, the the guy who did the score for Eternal Sunshine came back to do um, Synecdoche, New York, his next movie. And Ooh, perfect segue. I, both have fantastic scores. Yeah. So even uh, as, as bonkers as the stuff on the screen is, I oh, will God. say yeah. the score to these two specifically, granted any movie it's important, but especially for these two uh, with just how crazy meta they are is still excellent. Let, let's and let's give the good people another synopsis. So, uh, Sendek, Synecdoche, New York, 2008. This one is both written and directed by Kaufman, and the film tells the story Directorial of an ailing debut. theater. Yeah, the film tells the story of an ailing ailing theater director who works on an increasingly elaborate stage production and whose extreme commitment to realism begins to blur the boundaries between fiction and reality. It stars Philip Seymour Hoffman, Samantha Morton, Michelle Williams, Catherine Keener, Emily Watson, Diane Weist, Weist, Jennifer Jason Lee, Hope Davis, and Tom Noonan. Very quickly, we have to, we have a lot more to go. Um, what, uh, now this one gets, uh, you know, before I, I pass it to you, this one gets the most criticism I, I've learned because yeah. like people are like, it's so pretentious and stuff like that. But I guarantee you this, guys, this is the, the true artists like the, the Kaufmans of the world. They're going to make stuff that I know when it's usually released or even a few years after, it's not going to get, you know, a ton of money or, you know, it needs time. Eventually, I, I guarantee you in 10 years and 20 years, people are going to look back and this is going to be on the like, you know, greatest of all time lists for, you know, 2008 or whatever the fuck the, the, the list is. Right. I think people will really grow to love this. Yeah. it The the first watch, which that it was that for me, uh, I can see how it it, it's it a comes off that film. way. Well, yeah. And, and just it again, it's it's very high, high concept in a way, too, that. Um, to touch back on what I was saying just a moment ago, this one almost literally takes place across like a lifetime. There's a mm-hmm. lot, a lot, lot, lot to this movie. So not only is its runtime a bit longer, um, but the, it's the, very dense. Yeah, it's, <laughs> so it's, it's an entire dense. lifetime and two hours. And that, and it, but also too in that the ways in which Coffin focuses, and that was Philip Seymour Hoffman, right? Yes. Yeah. He's yeah. he's excellent. The the ways in which he uses the characters and their relationships to once, you know, display the human condition uh, with once again, like the affairs, love stuff like work struggles, um, personal loss. It's those are the moments that really hit m- more throughout the movie, in my opinion, at least they did for me because of how high concept and basically science fiction. Some of it kind of is um, it's literally yeah, it's like he literally the the name is is a play on Schenectady where it takes place in New York a real place but the, the Schenectady is actually another word for when part of something is used to refer to the whole so if you're calling like oh like you know oh you got some new wheels well wheels clearly means car or like oh look at these suits well that that suits means businessmen so it's like using just one aspect of something to describe it as a whole so i think in a way it's it's meant to talk about how it starts in one location and then his work builds, his work like uh, grows and elevates in a way. Uh, and then it literally begins to elevate when he makes his own like small city to where that then expands. And it takes like a life of its own. It li- literally becomes a, a miniature version of New York in which like supposedly like 17 million people live or something. It's it's wild. It's just like and that's just happening in the background. It really does focus on the main character, uh, Philip yeah. Seymour Hoffman's character. Uh, what was it like? Craig? No, not Craig. Uh, Caden. Sorry, that I knew it was a, a K name. But he's once again, you've got somebody very neurotic. Uh, they are also plagued with a ton of ailments as the film goes along. It's like this one is just so much more uncomfortable um, mm. in many ways. In that, like the scale of the movie starts to make you feel small as a person. It's a lot more about death, uh, about just your literal physical health. The way that again, Philip Seymour Hoffman's character continues to have more and more shit happen. He lives through so many deaths, both familial. And like professional relationship stuff, um, just the mm. the wild different types of affairs and relationships that the people around him have. 
Um, I, I can see how this one was a lot to process. And it really would take it, it, it's it, a lot. It's gonna it's gonna take a lot of thought and time to to get through and digest to be able to give an accurate, even just to describe it to somebody else, much less give your review and take on it because there's there's so much to unpack. I mean, that's a that's a well put, an excellent synopsis, and that that uh, leads us to another uh, another strange tale. We have two more on his on his main list, and that's uh, Anomalisa. So like Anomaly, Anomalisa in 2015. Now, this one is really unique because it is a film that includes stop motion animation. Yep. Uh, and it's based on the on an audio play he did um, a time back, focusing on British middle-aged customer service expert Michael Stone, played by David Thewlis, who Love perceives him. everyone. Oh, yeah, we'll see him again. I'm, I'm thinking of any things. Who perceives everyone, uh, Tom, who's played by Tom Noonan, as identical. And this is actually a real phenomenon called the Fregoli delusion, where um, I actually had to look this up, because, and it was very fascinating. I feel like we could spend fucking half the show just talking about this, where there is a condition where you think that everyone is the exact same person, and they're either in disguise or um, pretending to be somebody else, but they're actually the same person. Um, so he thinks everyone in the world and in existence is, is identical, except for one woman named Elisa Hesselman, played by Jennifer Jason Lee. This one is like if midlife crisis had a horrible baby with solipsism and okay. that he is, <laughs> and that the main character Man, is, he's you have been thinking out. about he's this. Freaking, a, yeah, the main character. That's quite a, that's quite a tag, <laughs> tag line. <laughs> is, he's freaking out because not only is he having a midlife crisis, but yeah, he literally, every other person in the world looks and sounds to him the same. And they're, they're all played by Tom Noonan and they all have the same face. Now, their hair is different. Their clothes are different. Their heights are different. Like a child still is the size of a child. They're not like identical, identical. But mm. as far as their voice being the same and, and the actor doing, of course, like different affectations and each like puppet or whatever you want to call it, of course, having mild differences outside of the face. But yeah, he's he's going through what I feel like is a midlife crisis and that it melds with this. Uh, it like pushes him over the edge when he finally hears in a voice that is not this one singular voice. And he starts trying to track them down and he's convinced that he's in love with them because even his wife and child sound like this other everyone to him and that it just goes on to, to include this like interesting nightmare scenario uh that at one point like kind of blends in you know you have that and again it's another hilarious trope where you don't see the break of whenever he potentially fell asleep you just see him wake up from this like oh my god what is happening kind of shit as things get more and more uh weird uh but there's so much of this one that there's so little actual action, if you will, that so much of this is, again, which is why I feel like it is another midlife. Why well, it wasn't audio play, it. too. It well, makes sense. True. Yeah. Them having to put a physicality to all of it um, and maybe make it more of like a, a feature length film. There's a lot of potential what you could just call filler and that there's just so much boring non moments. It's it's I, I, I kind of struggled <laughs> to pay close attention to this movie because I, I feel like but it, it again, it's it's got to be intentional because it is a about the mundane about how just blah bland day in day out some life uh, so many lives wind up being right people talk about that of just same shit different day it's very much yeah. an embodiment of that and yet that this oh god is that i feel guy's, that way a lot right right <laughs> yeah i mean um yeah i think that's, we all do right i think it's oh, another absolutely. human condition thing yeah i mean it's especially just especially with all this pandemic bullshit where we were stuck inside for so long <sighs> oh, it was yeah. like groundhog day but yeah i think i think that's very much a way to build up to the height of the action in which the main character um does these things has has these supposed like new experience all of a sudden and then all the sort sort of fallout from it and how it's just got him in a rut um in so interesting it's a very okay. it's a unique yeah. movie um again so I, check it out check it out yeah, people it, this, give it a give it a give it a watch also very again very unique in that his his only stop motion and he he co-directed it as well obviously you need somebody who knows stop motion but uh basically starting with synecdoche He's been directing his own films. Yeah, and that brings us to I'm Thinking of Ending Things 2020, uh, both, as already stated, both written and directed by and Charlie Kaufman. adaptation. <laughs> the film, yes, this was based off of a novel uh, a few years back, and it tells the story of a young woman, played by Jesse Buckley, who goes on a trip with her boyfriend, played by Chessie Plemons, to meet his parents. 
played by Tony Collette and David Thewlis again, David. which is um, so that basic premise. Now that on paper sounds simple, but there's so many strange. I mean, I really feel like the movie was shot like a horror film. Like it was. You get, there's so many, there's so many uh, moments of tension and of creepiness. Horror. Yeah. There's so many things like that. Cause uh, this goes definitely down the uh, horror lane of surrealism. And though it's a very simple thing on paper like that, please watch the film to understand how weird it gets with um, all of these weird intricacies along the way. And what's inter- interweaved with the story is uh, a story of a janitor played by Guy Boyd, who's going to work every day. And eventually you see how these two narratives meet. Um I I actually had to look this up. So this one is one of those films that is so weird, like it doesn't hold your hand, no. uh, that I actually had to I had to do some serious homework and be like, what the fuck is going on here? And I learned that uh, a little bit of spoilers. Um, so pause it if you haven't seen it yet. Uh, but um, but if you're still listening, tough titties. That's what we say here. Um, th- everything is going on in the janitor's head. So this is really a yeah. um, psychological tale of janitor. That's why it's so surreal. Yeah. It's so janitor's weird. old man version of your main character or one of the main characters, Jesse Plemons. Right. And he went through, you know, I, th- I think it's one of those age old stories of, we have so many aspirations and hopes for what our future can be. And when that doesn't come to fruition, instead of finding contentment, we often find sorrow and depression and we think we're could have been. worthless. Yeah. We're, we're worthless and we're nobodies. And instead of just, you know, finding contentment with how things played out, um, that sorrow gets played out in a narrative way why, with this, uh, with this story that unfolds in his head. But as, as an audience, we get to watch it played out by these actresses and these scenes. And it is, um, I remember I'll never forget like asking my wife, to watch this with me and like she just got busy doing something it wasn't like she was like you know um like putting me off because she like was was dying not to see this (laughs) but i ended up just watching it by myself and i remember telling her you know you you really i think you really dodged a bullet i think you would have been so weirded out like because some there's there's kind of there's a kind of weird where like i i love weird i love strange love love eccentric yeah i love 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 it but i know most people don't love it and this is, you know, so when it's done really well. So like Eternal Sunshine is a perfect example of really weird, but done in a way that's very, you know, um, uh, comfortable for all kind of audiences. Whereas I'm thinking of anything that's not for everybody. So uh, take that with a grain of salt. I still if you like the weird, check it out. But I I, I, uh, I will give you a warning. It's not going to be for everyone. You'll probably have a, a, an SO that's like, fuck, what the fuck is this? What is, yeah, what is happening? This is not something that I I. Yeah, I, I I now clearly know who to who and to who not to recommend this. Exactly. Um, I I really also kind of hope that with the sort of thrilling elements of this, like I said, it you it it touch it borders on like horror at times. Exactly. Uh, I was really hoping for that at one point because I also now think that with just how surreal, um, Kaufman's <laughs> writing can be and the friends that he he's made in his career, his professional relationships with some directors. I'm like, please dabble in some horror for me. Oh Carly. yeah, like we please, can get some, we can get some weird. Please shit. go oh, team yeah. up with like Mike Flanagan or something. There you go. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh my god, like that would be a dream. That's a dream pairing. team. Um, yeah, that's a dream team. Um, yeah, again, he adapted this story from a book. He directed this one. Um, and again, it's it it has the surreal, but in this one, it's a minimalist surrealism. So much of it takes place uh, like just inside of a car. You don't see like the actual road or the city countryside behind near the much when they stop at like that ice cream place. It seems like it's just in the fucking void, you know, like (laughs) so many shots are just of one object, whether it is an entire location, um, which again, like I feel like a third of the movie takes place in, in the guy's car. So that is to me the surrealist aspect of how, you know, like the the parents house seems like it's middle of nowhere. The ice cream place, middle of nowhere. The car just going down like abstract, like nowhere road. Well, like, they are because it was in his mind. True, so. true. That's a good point. That might have been more intentional than I even realized because uh, it is <laughs> it is him recounting real life events. But you're right. Like the memories are just of what happened. I don't inside think I don't car. even think it's 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 him recounting in his mind. I think there's a lot of subconscious things going on. That's why it's OK or, or it's not chaotic. It's just so 
at times nonsensical. Yeah. It's it's strange, especially with like the very very end where they're doing the scene of Oklahoma and there's like an animated portion too. Yeah, uh, it, and, it and goes then he's just walking and and like he's in his underwear and stuff like that. Yeah. Where I'm just like, what? Um, but um, guys, my God, check it out. Um, before we uh, get into the conclusion, I do want to give a quick lightning round rundown of his humble beginnings and some of his other work and credits. So in television, his writing credits include Get a Life, The Edge, The Trouble with Larry, The Dana Carvey Show, Ned and Stacy. Uh, writing, direction, and producing credits, he has one, and that's How and Why in 2014. Just production is Misery Loves Company. Uh, we already talked about one of his plays. He has two, uh, Hope Leaves the Theater and uh, Anomalisa. There we go. Uh, literature, we already talked about Ant Kind. I think eventually I'll pick this up. I think we both need to, and I encourage you guys to do so as well. I bet it's He's great. Also- yeah, I bet it's great, too. And I bet it's like very Kauf- Kaufman, oh, so, like with all of his other stuff. He's also written lyrics for uh, some of the songs that are in his soundtracks. That includes Hair Everywhere, Here With You, and Human Nature. Uh, the Say It Again, Sendaki. Sendaki. Yes. So that song, Gravity, Little Person, and Song for Caden. Uh, None of them are you, uh, Anna Malisa, and Tulsi Town Jingle. I'm thinking of ending things. So tell the good people, let's bring it on home, Tybo on this B. Tell the good people why they need to get into the work that is Charlie Kaufman. No matter how wacky or out there you have ever felt thinking, much less even acting out some of your ideas, your thoughts. <laughs> They're not bad. <laughs> no, there, it, it's this work by Charlie Kaufman is a fantastic way of recognizing and reinforcing just how broad and yet still very specific any one person's art can be at any one moment. And that be as surreal, be as off the wall or as grounded or both at the same time as you want. Good art will always leave its impression and will take on the life of its own as showcased over and over again with him again like focusing on adaptation of things with him focusing on relationships with people revisiting those same relationships but from different perspectives and time um and just his his commitment to own more and more of of the craft uh, of just you know again come from humble beginnings and then just see where it takes you uh is what he's literally done and it's it's gone really just increasingly interestingly and well for him alone so that i by all means hope he continues to just churn out work um and and how his his stuff again it just takes the surreal and it grounds it just enough for us to get lost in it for a bit absolutely and um i couldn't have said it better myself well put and there you have it folks uh the career thus far of Charlie Kaufman. And just like Philip said, we hope to see more from this excellent artist, very much writer and director. Um, But before we go, of course, you know, we have a little more for you, a little extra, a little icing on the cake, a little cherry on top with what we call the gym of the week. If you don't know what the gym of the week is, it's essentially something we like to talk about here at the end of our shows. That doesn't always fit into the scheme of the episode because it may just be on our radar in the last day or so, week, maybe month, but we got to give it to you guys so you guys can dig deeper. Before we talk about it, we have to talk about their sponsor. Today's gems are brought to you by Zencaster. Zencaster is our go-to tool for remote podcast recordings. What's great is that you can record separate audio and video tracks. And it's all backed up on a secured cloud so you never lose your hard work. Even better, it's easy to use and there's nothing to download. So go to zen.ai, that's zen.ai slash art of the beholder and get 30% off your first three months with the pro account or you can just use promo code art of the beholder. Now, let's get back to the gems. Mine are short and sweet um two musical artists uh one is called dark side they put an album out uh just last year called spiral and uh one i'm absolutely in love with which is a radiohead a little side project called the smile they have their first lp out philip what do you got for us a british tv show Hmm. it's funny that earlier i was talking about often comedy maybe doesn't stand on its own too well unless it is very good This is one of my favorite comedy shows, and it's called Friday Night Dinner. There's really not too many recognizable faces, which in a a way I think lends to how just funny it ends up being. Um, It's not like your top BBC actors, actresses, um, but it's it's just it's a it's a Jewish family. But they're kind of like how a lot of uh, modern religious people are in that they're more just like, oh, we kind of celebrate the high holidays, but don't take it seriously. 
But p- basically, the reason it's relevant is because a not only is it present in the show, but it's because they still do the uh, a Friday night dinner, um, hmm. as I think like sort of like a spinoff of certain Jewish uh, traditions and like um, I've already blanked on the word again. But anyways, it, it <laughs> is truly hilarious. The two boys, uh, the sons. Friday night dinner. And what uh, network is it on? BBC? Yeah, it was a BBC show. Uh, it's easily 10 years old by now or something. So maybe not quite 10, but getting there. And uh, I want to say it came out in like 2013 or 14 or something. So I watched it on Amazon Prime. Okay, guys, check it out. And uh, if you like that, of course, you can follow us at all of our socials. That's at underscore Novo underscore Day and Day is D-E and at Novo Day Media. You can, of course, check out our products at NovoDayProductions.com. There you'll find things like the Entropy Sessions, Post Meridium, Adulteration, Cancel Culture Lotto, and some other things in the oven. Of course, the show, you'll see ads for this. Uh, so don't forget to like, subscribe, do all the things, rate and review. You know the drill. We don't have to tell you. Just go ahead and do it. Just fucking do it. And if you'd like to sponsor our little love child here, you can reach out to us at NovoDayMedia at gmail.com if you want to get a hold of Mr. Philip Church and I heard that demo. Tell the good people about the Ooh, demo and what they wait. can do for you. Yeah, I finally got around to getting a commercial, dem- commercial demo cut and um, it's it's awesome. I love it. Uh, it's on my website, philipchurch.tech, uh, but I definitely like tweeted it, Instagram posted it, I did all the things. Um, but yeah, my website is the best place to find me as well as uh, a list of all my previous audiobooks. Uh, speaking of which, too, um, there is a, a brand new one. I literally think like as of today, uh, another mm. another short, a short little indie work called Tendrils. It's kind of it's a sci fi uh, fun nice. little, not quite action, but still it's kind of a mystery, I guess you should uh, I could say. Um, it, it's it's a pretty interesting book, actually. I, I had a great time working on it. Uh, so I've got two awesome new things that are out. Um, that I'll Great. definitely be putting some promo codes out there too. So again, if you like the idea of um, aliens with less violence, um, <laughs> but very much like sort of parasitic type things, uh, it, it's a fun wow. read. So, um, you know, check out my website. I'll be putting blog posts about it with uh, promo codes. Tendrils? Yes, tendrils. Interesting. Uh, so you can check oh, out the demo, man. check out my new book, um, philipchurch.tech. Guys, do it. And until next time, be good to each other. And as always, good luck and Godspeed. We love ya. Art of the Beholder is brought to you by Novo Day Productions. Created and hosted by Novo Day and the Novo Day Collective. Facebook.com slash Novo Day Media. At Novo Day Media on Twitter and Instagram. Music by A Company. Facebook.com slash Aco Music 123. Aco on Spotify. Logo designed by Tom Justice, J-E-S-T-U-S, of thejusticecompany.com, and executively produced by Clayton Anderson. All rights reserved. Bees!